Hello, everyone, and welcome to the April presentation of the Friends of History First Wednesday Lecture Series. I'm Ben Woodbury with the Friends of History. The monthly lectures are being provided free of charge by the Friends of History with support from the New Mexico History Museum. We do, however, accept and encourage donations. These funds will go directly to support the lecture series and more importantly, all History Museum programs and exhibits. Should you wish to make a donation, just go to our website and click on the donate button at the top of the page. If you wish to learn more about all upcoming lectures or about Friends of History in general, we urge you to join our mailing list. If you have not already done so, either via our webpage or by emailing us at nmhmfriendsofhistory at gmail.com. Today, we are introducing a change in our program format. The question and answer session is being discontinued for the time being. We do, however, look forward to renewing this dialogue when the first Wednesday lecture series returns to live presentations in the History Museum's auditorium later this year. We do continue to post this talk and all past and future presentations in the lecture series on our webpage, friendsofhistorynm.org. Today, we're happy to welcome Gordon Brunitsky, the founder and president of Indija Now. Gordon grew up in Albuquerque and is trained as an archeologist. He has a BA in, from the University of New Mexico, received in 1971, and received a PhD from the University of Arizona in 1977. For the last 28 years, he has been the founder, president of the nonprofit Indigen Now. This program works with indigenous artists and performers, both traditional and contemporary, to bring their voices and messages to the world. Gordon will speak today on Miguel Trujillo, New Mexico's unknown civil rights hero. Through his efforts after World War II, Miguel was a primary force in the guaranteeing of the rights of Native Americans to vote in New Mexico. Now let us welcome our speaker, Gordon Bronitsky. I want to thank everyone for this opportunity to talk about New Mexico's great unknown civil rights hero, Miguel Trujillo. It's really unusual, I think, that one individual can be singled out for playing a decisive role in the history of the struggle for civil rights. Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks have earned places. Other people have. But another pioneer was a man named Miguel Trujillo from Isleta Pueblo. For most Americans, Indians remain the backdrop to real American history. And Indian heroes are the warriors of the past. Crazy Horse, Sitting Bull, Geronimo. Yet in the 20th century, Miguel Trujillo directly confronted bias and prejudice from Indians and non-Indians that discouraged Indian participation in the larger system. Using the American legal system as his weapon, he fought to make democracy work for all citizens while proudly maintaining his Indian identity and his Indian strength. People don't realize that racism against American Indians in the Southwest was a powerful factor, as it was with Miguel Trujillo, and continues to be. For instance, if people are familiar with the state of Arizona, the Navajo Nation, the, the United States' largest Indian reservation, is northeastern New Arizona. It is composed of two counties, Apache and Navajo County, which are long, thin, rectangular counties with county seats that are at the southern end of these counties. These counties were deliberately created to create white majorities on Navajo land and the county seats were, were uh, positioned where they are, St. John's for instance and Winslow, to be as far away from the Navajo reservation to make it difficult for Indians to go to the county seat and seek redress of grievances or whatever they were doing. Right now, in uh, southeastern Utah, in um, San Juan County, there is an ongoing fight 
between Navajo citizens and the town of Bluff, because several years ago, for the first time, Indians gained the majority on the county commission, which controls a lot of what happens in the county. And it created an uproar by non-native citizens of, of San Juan County that continues today. So the, the struggle that Miguel helped fight and won continues. And I think we can all be proud that it was another um, member of Laguna Pueblo, Deb Holland, who became the first uh, New Mexico congressional representative who was Native American and was from a Native village and who is now the secretary of the Department of the Interior. As she says, she's standing on Miguel's shoulders and he made it possible. How did this happen? In 1924, an act of Congress made all American Indians into US citizens. Nonetheless, the state of New Mexico continued to deny the right to vote in state elections to all Indians living on reservations. This was based on a section of the New Mexico State Constitution of 1912, which prohibited suffrage to quote, Indians not taxed. That's 1912. In 1948, a special three judge federal court in Santa Fe ruled that this was discriminatory and that there was no basis for this discrimination in law so that Indians gained the right to vote in state elections in 1948. And the individual most responsible for this decision was a man named Miguel Trujillo, an, a Laguna, an Indian, Isleta Indian living at Laguna Pueblo. Next slide, please. Here's a map of the Pueblos. You can see Laguna Pueblo west of Albuquerque. You can see Isleta Pueblo just south of Albuquerque. Next slide, please. To assess the impact of this monumental 1948 decision, it's necessary to look at the law, the times, and the man. People like Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. have gained justifiable recognition for their part in the civil rights struggle. Why hasn't Miguel Trujillo achieved equal stature? Who was he? In 1948, Miguel Trujillo was an ex-Marine sergeant and a teacher at the Bureau of Indian Affairs Day School in Laguna Pueblo. And here's a picture of Isleta Pueblo. We'll see others in a minute. He was also a candidate for a master's degree at the University of New Mexico. On June 14, 1948, Miguel Trujillo attempted to register to vote in Los Lunas and was refused by the recorder of Valencia County under the Indians Not Taxed provision. Miguel Trujillo and his attorney, Felix Cohen, whom we'll also hear more about in a little while, asked the federal district court in New Mexico for an injunction restraining the recorder. Indians had attempted to register to vote before, after the 1912 statehood and the 1912 constitution, but they were unsuccessful. Indians were harassed. Indians attempting to register to vote in New Mexico were beaten. What made Trujillo decide to press this issue further at that time? According to his daughter, the late Josephine Wakanda, Trujillo initiated the legal action to bring equality to Indian people. He was a member of the All Indian Pueblo Council. He tried to get the council to unite on the issue. And when they didn't, he went ahead on his own. So let's take a look. Here again is a slide of is led a Pueblo where he was born. Next slide. A slightly older painting of the Pueblo of his letter with the church and the plaza. Miguel Miguel's father died when he was quite young and his mother was left to raise the children alone. Miguel Trujillo began attending school at the Albuquerque Indian School, which at that time only had 10 grades. As he grew up, friends and family urged him to drop out of school and support his family. But he felt education was essential and continued to attend school against the wishes really of his family. And in this, he was encouraged by a teacher at the Albuquerque Indian School, a woman named Isis Harrington and graduated from the Indian School. Trujillo then went on to Haskell Institute 
in Lawrence, Kansas, which was at that time um, essentially a boarding high school for Indians from all over the United States. It's now a university. He supported himself in the summers by working in the beet fields of Kansas and Colorado. And while he was at Haskell, he met a woman from Laguna named Ruchanda Paisano, who was a member of the Haskell class of 1928. And ultimately they were married. And after they were married, they returned to her village at Laguna and he began teaching with the Bureau of Indian Affairs at Laguna. Next slide, please. Here's a view of the church and the village of Old Laguna. Next slide, please. And the church at Laguna. He had an incredible drive for education. He continued. He took classes at the University of New Mexico, which meant commuting. And at that time, there was no freeway from Laguna to Albuquerque. And a drive that now takes probably 40 minutes then took two or three hours at, at, in each direction. And he, there were no scholarships. He may have well have been one of the first Native Americans to attend UNM. And so he was supporting his wife. He was supporting their children and he was supporting his mother and working at Laguna and going to class. And amazingly, after 15 years of persistence, Miguel Trujillo finally received his bachelor's degree just in time for the onset of World War II. Next slide, please. As many other Indians did, Miguel Trujillo enlisted in the Marines, ultimately becoming a staff sergeant. Here's a picture of him with his father and mother and his daughter, Josephine Wakanda. Next slide. And another picture of him with his daughter, Josephine. And he returned to his family and he continued teaching, working, you know, getting an education on the GI Bill. What was it about post-World War II New Mexico that encouraged Indians and Miguel Trujillo in particular to push for the right to vote. As I mentioned, previous attempts to end this discrimination were discouraged and unsuccessful. Indians who attempted to register vote were harassed, uh, threatened with job loss, and occasionally beaten. And in a state where the majority party, which was the Republican Party before World War II, held power by an 8,000 vote margin, not everyone favored enfranchisement of some 20,000 Indian voters. But the times began to change. In 1947, the report of the President's Commission on Civil Rights was published, which condemned disenfranchisement of Indians in New Mexico and Arizona, noting that Indians were citizens and subject to federal and state taxes. And the committee recommended that New Mexico and Arizona grant suffrage to Indian citizens. <coughs> Attempts by Indians to gain voting rights in, in both Arizona and New Mexico attracted a great deal of public support because the plaintiffs, both Miguel Trujillo in New Mexico and the plaintiffs in Arizona were veterans of the army from World War II. And in Trujillo's case, the presiding judge at the, uh, in 1948 ultimately declared, and I quote, it is perhaps not entirely pertinent to the question here, but we know how those New Mexico Indians have responded to the need of the country in time of war in a patriotic, wholehearted way, both in furnishing manpower and the military forces and in the purchase of war bonds and patriotic contributions of that character. Why should they be deprived of their rights to vote now because they are, fa they are favored by the federal government in exempting lands from taxation? Other pressures were also being brought to bear. The federal government threatened to withdraw funds that denied social security to Indians. And at the same time, post-World War II era was the beginning of the Cold War. And it was increasingly difficult for the United States to condemn communist regimes for mistreatment of their citizens, while American citizens were denied equality on the basis of race and color. And you see this elsewhere. This is a time when African-Americans begin pushing hard for the right to vote, when Mexican-American citizens begin pushing hard for the right to vote. And Miguel Trujillo was certainly part of that post-World War II wave of, of veterans demanding the right to vote. 
So when he was refused the right to register, Miguel contacted an attorney named Felix Cohen, who was at that time the tribal attorney for Laguna Pueblo. And, and Felix Cohen is worth talking about as well. Briefly, he was the, the chief of the Indian Law Survey. He, com he compiled the federal laws and treaties about American Indians. And ultimately in 1941, published what is called the Handbook of Federal Indian Law, which to this day remains the bedrock, the foundation for all American Indian law in the United States. He created really the field of federal Indian law. Ultimately, he retired from the federal government. He went into private practice. And as I said, in 1948, he was the, the tribal attorney for the Pueblo of Laguna. So Miguel Trujillo and Felix Cohen took their case to a special three judge appellate court in Santa Fe, a court that was appointed to rule on the injunction requested by Trujillo, because essentially what Trujillo was asking was that um, the registrar in Los Lunas be enjoined from refusing to allow him to register. And the argument that Miguel Trujillo and Felix Cohen presented was that the constitutional provision which excluded Indians not taxed violated the 15th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which stated that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. They were saying that the Constitution of the United States said that it was illegal and unconstitutional to prevent Indians from voting. The, the, the argument settled a great deal around taxation. Uh, Indians not taxed really meant Indians who did not pay taxes on tribal trust land. And as part of their case, Miguel Trujillo and Felix Cohen argued, first of all, that Indians did pay taxes. They paid sales taxes, they paid income taxes, they paid other taxes as well. They just didn't pay taxes on trust land. They further argued that New Mexico allowed other citizens who did not own land, who perhaps lived in an apartment, whether they were black or white, to vote. And that this was indeed unconstitutional. And they stated that the Congress had ruled that the policy of declaring Indians not taxed was obsolete on precisely the grounds that Indians paid taxes. And on the basis of this decision, New Mexico Indians had been counted in the 1940 congressional appointment as citizens, which essentially resulted in an extra congressman for the United States, for the state of New Mexico. So even in 1940, even though they couldn't vote, they were counted as citizens for the purpose of determining voter districts, congressional districts. So on August 3rd of 1948, the presiding judge delivered the decision for the panel the court ruled that those portions of the New Mexico Constitution that denied the right to vote to Indians were unconstitutional and void, and that the plaintiff and all the citizens of Indian blood had the right to be registered. After 36 years of statehood, New Mexico was forced to grant its Indian citizens voting rights in state and local elections. This decision received considerable favorable attention at the time. Next slide, please. Here's a picture of attorney Felix Cohen. Next slide, please. Okay. The Secretary of the Interior, the National Congress of the American Indians all praised this decision. Um, Miguel Trujillo continued to serve as a teacher at the Indian School at Laguna and raise his family and in fact, later received an award from the Department of Interior for his, quote, unselfish devotion to public service and exceptional interest in the welfare and advancement of Indian people, and was in fact given an award of appreciation by the people of Laguna. Nonetheless, the name of Miguel Trujillo faded away. Today, very few people recall him. Elsewhere in the United States, the movement for equality and justice for all citizens gained momentum, changing forever 
the course of this country. Individuals, again, like Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. and so many others gained recognition for their part in the struggle. Why hasn't Miguel Trujillo achieved equal stature? Perhaps, as his daughter Josephine Wakanda once said, his time came late. The late 1940s and early 1950s saw a major push for relocating Indians out of reservations, for terminating reservations, terminating Indian com communities in an attempt to bring them all into the mainstream. And Trujillo's defense of Indians and Indianness at meetings of the All Indian Pueblo Council elsewhere led to pressure from superiors in the Bureau of Indian Affairs, ultimately leading to the threat to transfer him to South Dakota. By this time, Trujillo's mother was in very poor health. He was taking care of her and his wife and his children. And frankly, Miguel Trujillo was afraid of what would happen to his mother if they moved to the cold climates of South Dakota. So Miguel compromised his outspoken defense of Indians and the family was instead transferred to Intermountain School in Brigham City, Utah, where he remained until he retired in 1959. Nonetheless, after he came back to Laguna and his community, he continued to press for education, taking courses for a doctorate at the University of California at Berkeley. Unfortunately, the responsibilities of family, his job, and his distance from the University of California prevented him from ever attaining the degree. After retiring from the Bureau of Indian Affairs in 1959, he did return to Laguna. He continued to work for Indians through the National Indian Council on Aging, the Social Welfare Organization of New Mexico, and the New Mexico Adult Education Association. Although his time may have come late, trying to promote suffrage in the face of many obstacles, gaining an education, a great personal sacrifice, always fighting to get things done. Trujillo's an ex example is one that deserves to be remembered. And I wanna close by explaining why I talk about him. In the 1980s, I met uh, Herman Agoyo, who was then president of the All Indian Pueblo Council, and we were talking about Indian voting. And he said, you should meet Miguel Trujillo's family. I had no idea who Miguel Trujillo was. And he explained to me who Miguel was. And I met his family and I ended up researching what he did. I ended up working again with his family in some other ways. I published. And when Miguel died in 1989 and was buried at the Pueblo of Isleta, I was honored by his family when they asked me to write his eulogy. And I promised then and there in the church at Isleta, I promised his daughter, Josephine, that I would always speak out about her father, Miguel Trujillo, and what he did. And I would do my best to make sure that people learned about Miguel Trujillo and his role in New Mexico civil rights history. So I wanna close this really with a thank you to Josephine Wakanda. She's not here anymore. But I thank you, Josephine, and I've kept my promise. Thank you.